Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to this live conversation on polar bears with WWF as part of our Polar Bear Week festivities. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. We're so happy to have you. My name is Weiwei Su, and I'm with the communications team at WWF Canada. Beside me is my silent sidekick, the panda. He's just going to sit there and hang out. Um, for the next half hour to 45 minutes, we are going to learn all about the polar bear in the Canadian Arctic. You might be excited to know that this is our first polar bear week. We wanted to um, use this week to raise awareness about the threats such as climate change facing this iconic species and to raise funds to protect its home. WWF's work in the Arctic is funded by our annual campaign called Arctic Home. From now until March 15th, Coca-Cola is doubling any donation to the Arctic Home campaign, but more on that later. So I know we've just met, but I'm going to make you a promise right now that by the end of this Google Hangout, you will have everything you need to impress your friends and family on International Polar Bear Day, which is tomorrow. So we don't have a lot of time. We need to get started. Um, so how are we going to do this? We are going to pick the brains of our brilliant experts, um, who I'll introduce to you in a second. And um, I also want to say that we that you have a chance to ask them questions at any time. You can do this in two ways. You can open the Q&A box on your Google Hangout page right below the video and type in your questions there, or you can email us at any time at live at wwfcanada.org. So don't be shy. You can send us a question right now, um, halfway through, whatever you'd like to do. This is your chance to get your burning polar bear questions answered. So let's, uh, let's meet our polar bear gurus. First, we have Dr. Pete Ewan. He is a marine scientist by training and the Arctic species expert at WWF. Pete first joined us in 1996. He has worked on the Arctic for over 20 years and now leads our Arctic species conservation work. Pete's focus is on flagship species in globally significant regions. So what does that mean? He pretty much knows everything there is about the polar bear and ice-dependent whales like the narwhal. So Pete, um, I want you to tell us what, what was it like the first time you saw a polar bear in person? Was it kind of love at first sight? I was completely shocked actually. I was <laughs> on one of my first trips in the mid-90s to the Canadian Arctic coming in to Clyde River Airport in a remote part of Baffin Island and uh, there it was running across the runway as the airplane came in so oh, it was an oh my god moment and of course uh, I was then clearly a naive greenhorn and I got out of the plane and started to walk over towards the polar where it was and thankfully one of the local baggage handlers said what the heck are you doing <laughs> it's gonna eat you if you go with it so that was my that was the first encounter <laughs> so not so much love at first sight from the polar bears perspective um, so let me introduce you now to our other expert, Dr. Stefan Peterson, who's joining us from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He is the head of conservation and research for the International Polar Bear Center, Conservation Center, and Assiniboine Park Zoo. Stefan has been in his position since 2011 and has been involved in the research partnership between WWF and the zoo. So throughout his career, Stefan has worked on nearly every Arctic marine mammal except the walrus. His specialty is using genetics to learn about populations and animal behavior. So Stefan, I want to ask you, what, what do you think is the coolest thing about the polar bear? Um, you know, or are you just a big softy for cute, cuddly animals? <laughs> well, I, I am a bit of a softy, but I think the most fascinating thing for me in polar bears is just how incredibly intelligent they are. Um, you can see it when they're walking across the ice, you can see it when you're um, interacting at closer scales, they just, there's a lot going on behind their eyes and uh, yeah, it's good to be on the, the non-seal end of the, that intelligence, but fascinating. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Well, we're really going to learn a whole lot about polar bears from you guys today and I want to start this off with um, a bit of trivia. If you, I know you guys have been sort of studying and, and of course you have so much information up there in your brains already, um, but uh, let's just see how this goes. Um, don't get nervous, you know, if you don't know the answer, I'm sure some, a, a member of the audience will know, 
you know, because uh, we've got some great people joining us today. So I'm going to start off with you, Pete. Um, how many ring seals do male polar bears have to eat every year to survive? Well, that's going to be, uh, oh, I would guess around 60. Okay, 60. That, I think that's right. I, I'm just checking my uh, answers here. Um, Stefan, I want to ask you, the heaviest polar bear ever recorded was estimated to weigh over 2,000 pounds. True or false? Uh, I think that one's true, but I have a little bit of skepticism about it because it was from Alaska. I think it was just over 1,000 kilograms, and I keep thinking, are you really going to measure a polar bear that big? Like, if you're out hunting, you're probably going to just say, ah, it's about this big. So, I, as with always, I'd like to see the data before I come down <laughs> hard well, and fast on this is what it is. Yeah, this is what I was saying to, uh, to our producer ahead of time. I was like, we're going to ask these guys trivia questions, and let's just see how many, uh, how long it's going to take them to, to answer. <laughs> So moving on, Pete, um, how how long do polar bears live on average in the wild? Try to limit your answer to like three words. Okay. okay. <laughs> Males shorter than females, I think, uh, 25 years. That's my guess. Okay. Good. Correct. Um, Stefan, wow. how I did, many... <laughs> I didn't know we were being judged on these as well. Yo, I got I three points, that. right? <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, how many teeth does a polar bear have? If uh, Assuming they have no cavities. <laughs> the, you know what? I should know because this was part of my cramming this morning, but I actually don't know. I know that there's some variation. You can have premolars. Oh, I see Pete oh, raising his hand. All right, Pete, take this one. Oh, it's it's somewhere around 40, I think. Okay. Well, I have 42, but that's pretty close. Um, Pete, back to you. What color is a polar bear's tongue and skin? A dark gray, uh, almost blackish, actually. Okay. Yeah. Actually, can you tell us why that is? No, Stefan's going to tell you. I'm going to give oh, him a Oh, okay. Bonus. All right, Stefan, <laughs> save yourself. <laughs> oh, nice. Takes the easy ones, passes <laughs> off. Um, but the tongues are actually mottled pink and kind of a darker color, um, which is cool. Um, and then the the skin, there's been a number of theories about kind of thermal gain with different color skin and the interaction between the fur and light transmitting properties of the fur. There's some recent kind of theoretical physics pa paper that came out that looked at kind of what the real advantage of having that gray body was. Um, but I'm sure when I said physics, everyone kind of nodded off. So Right. Yeah. <laughs> OK, look, back to the uh, trivia. Um, Stefan or Pete, either one, um, what is the biggest threat facing the polar bear today? I know it's kind of a big question. That's, uh, that's the rapid. Uh, reductions in sea ice cover and thickness, which is their fundamental way to get out towards where the food is. Yeah, okay. And we're going to talk a bit more about that in a little bit. Um, and finally, Stefan, how many penguins do female polar bears eat in a month? <laughs> he gets all the easy as, ones. What kind of as, game is this? <laughs> as many as they can get their hands on, which tends to be zero. <laughs> right. Okay, good. That was, that was uh, meant to be a trick question. <laughs> Okay, so the fun part's over. Now we're going to get really serious. Um, no, I'm just kidding. So, Pete, um, I think it would be great if you can give us sort of the big picture. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the threats, but um, in terms of how the impacts of climate change and melting sea ice is affecting the wildlife, the people, the communities, and the, the polar bear. Yeah, I, I guess you have to start answering this by looking at things in terms of the Earth, and our planet, that we share with polar bears, and of course the map behind me uh, you know, shows you a big part of the range of the polar bear, and over a million years or so, of course the polar bear and a bunch of other species have developed these fantastic adaptations to surviving in these ridiculously harsh uh, environments. And it's the rate of change to just the, the climate and also those ice conditions 
that is so unprecedentedly fast now that there's actually no evidence. Um, scientists have looked for it, but they haven't found anything close to suggest that polar bears or many of these other ice-evolved species are actually have actually been able to survive such rapid rates of change to that system which they call home. And so the jury's still out as to uh, which of these species are going to be able to adapt to these rapid rates of change in that kind of million dollar, million a year time scale, uh, and which ones are going to be uh, severely affected. It's very clear from the work in southern Hudson Bay, out of Churchill and uh, areas near there, where, that polar bears are in big decline now because the sea ice is, is just not there for longer and longer. Open water it means they have to sit on the beach. So I would say the evidence for polar bears is that they are losers in that uh, rapid habitat change game and other species harp seals and red foxes and others are our winners at this point mm -hmm. and we're continuing to learn more about it as as we go sure. um, I, I do want to ask a question from the audience um, this was sent in early to us from Shirlene in Toronto who wants to know um, how many species of bears are there besides polar bears and where do they live Stefan Stefan, yeah, maybe you take that. You take it. <laughs> so I think there's seven other species, and they're throughout most of the rest of the uh, the globe, uh, except for Antarctica. But there's bears in South America and Central America, in Asia. I don't know if there's an African bear. Is there? Anyway, I think so. No, maybe okay. not Africa, but. Okay, great. See, we're we're learning so much about not just polar bears, but all other kinds of bears. Um, and remember uh, to send in your questions and comments through the Q and A box or email us at live at wwfcanada.org. Um, so, Stefan, um, it's almost March, and that's when uh, polar bear mothers and their cubs begin to come out of their dens. Um, I've seen pictures of this, and it's you know amazing it's 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 such an amazing time of the year can you talk about what is happening um, how are they getting ready to sort of come out yeah sure um, so about this time of year they've been born they're probably born about December um, they stayed in the den cold conserving energy growing but they need to get out and stretch their legs and then they need to get out onto that sea ice as fast as possible so the, what seems to happen is the mums break out, they spend some time around the dens, and then they'll kind of head towards the coastline, and then kind of coinciding with when there's tasty seals out on the ice that are accept, uh, um, accessible and quite naive and stupid, then mums and cubs head out onto the ice and start eating as many seals as they can before that ice disappears. Okay. So, yeah, that denning, denning areas and that denning time are really kind of a critical time. Yep. And, um, and this brings me to my next question, which is that last year the Arctic Home Campaign funded a joint project with um, the Assiniboine Park Zoo and WWF to map these dens in Nunavut. Uh, what did we learn from this? Yeah, we actually wanted to look at the entire Canadian Arctic. You think that something as important as polar bear denning areas at such a key time of life and polar bears being so amazing that we would know everything we need to know about their habitat requirements and where they are but it turns out that there's still a lot of unanswered questions so what we wanted to do was pull together all of the traditional ecological knowledge all of the published uh, scientific research all of the reports and compile all that information to say where do bears den in the Canadian Arctic? And, and then use that to say, well, these are important places, but also to highlight places where we don't have any information. Okay, that's right. And uh, I think we can see the map right now on the screen of, uh, of, of kind of what you're talking about here. I've, I have a question actually from uh, our friend Jordan in grade five who wants to know, how do bears choose where to build their dens? <laughs> It's interesting. I, I don't have the definitive answer, of, of course, but it looks like uh, in some places like southern Hudson's Bay, they're using um, kind of banks of streams and peat, 
places where they can dig into uh, peat. Um, and then in the high Arctic, they need enough snow cover to kind of, or enough topographic relief, enough bumps in the, the land to collect snow. And then they can go and dig right into where that snow is collected. So what's going through uh, the mum's brain when she's looking for a place, I'm not quite sure. But it needs to hold enough snow so they can stay there all winter long um, and not be exposed kind of halfway through. Yeah, maybe I can maybe I can add one thing because a sure. couple of times I have been into the denning areas there uh, inland in Manitoba, and uh, you can actually see the females uh, at a couple of points uh, taking their young in the first year and a half, two years. They actually take the young back at some point inland to show them the the type of denning habitat and of course that's probably pretty boring for the male cubs because <laughs> they've got no need to go back there but for the female cubs that's pretty crucial and that's really showing them what type of areas to look in and uh, I think there's evidence that certainly south of Churchill those female bears will go into the den before the snow ever comes just to show their you know nine month old uh, female cubs um, that's a good place and kind of like that's where you were born. <laughs> Oh, I like that. Um, actually, I have another question for you, Pete, from uh, Paula, who wants to know, who says, I'm just curious as to where we stand with respect to genetic diversity in the polar bear species. Are there concerns about a bottleneck effect eventually, and if so, what can be done? Well, I'll give a short answer here, but I know that Stefan is a, a trained geneticist and much more knowledgeable on this. but. Clearly, when the last uh, Wisconsin uh, glaciation was happening, you know, polar bears went through a genetic bottleneck. Uh, they were pushed uh, to the edges of their range much further south, and so the, the numbers would have been smaller. And uh, I'm I'm assuming that today's genetic diversity reflects that. But uh, there certainly are important long-term conservation questions uh, arising from that bottleneck and perhaps future ones to come. Right, Stefan? Yeah, that's true. We can definitely see the the evidence of a genetic bottleneck in certain kind of genomes in the in the polar bears, and we expect that in the future. Right now, the estimated population size is twenty thousand to twenty five thousand. We know that polar bears can move incredible distances, so we seem to have good gene flow through most of the 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 region. So at this point. I don't think there's a big concern about genetic diversity, but we know as soon as populations start to become fragmented, separated, get lower population size, we'll start to, to run into problems with genetic diversity. Okay. I, I have another question. This one's pretty neat, um, maybe for Pete. Eric and Allison, who are in grade four, wants to know, how do you tell males and females apart, and how do polar bears choose a mate? It's actually quite difficult. Uh, obviously, a very big male polar bear uh, has a big Roman nose, and he's just much bigger. So if you've seen a few polar bears and you see a massive one out there um, on the ice, it's a male. They also have much longer hairs as they lumber along on the sea ice, and long hairs uh, dragging a bit like a lion's mane from their, mm. their front limbs. But uh, I've, I've been there... Uh, near Churchill and in other places with Inuit experts and science experts and you know I've guessed and they said can't tell so uh, you know small female polar bears uh, you know just small versions of males at a distance if you haven't got a male and a female together it's, it's actually quite difficult sometimes okay and Stefan maybe you can uh, answer the question about how do they choose a mate <laughs> you guess I... all the fun questions <laughs> <laughs> Um, we know because there's a big size difference between males and females that females are probably looking for the biggest male that they can run into in the ice. So I think yeah. the short answer is probably the more large and, and uh, older I guess the male is, or largeness at least, um, the more fit and the better offspring that he'll produce. So that's probably a big factor in, in choice right there. Okay, great. So uh, Pete, back to you. 
Um, earlier you talked about how climate change is affecting the landscape of the Arctic and um, this is uh, causing interactions and conflicts between polar bears and humans in northern communities. Can you explain a bit about what is happening and how is it affecting uh, the people and the wildlife there? Yeah, the short version is that in the, the summer, which is getting ever longer, uh, these polar bears, once they've put as many seals, seal fat into their body stores, they come ashore, the ice is all gone, and they have to stay on the shore for longer and longer. And each day they burn uh, up to a kilogram of body weight off just sitting there trying to keep cool on the, the beach because it gets pretty hot, uh, certainly in southern parts of the Arctic in summer. And, of course, once that uh, fat reserve and their energy starts to run down, they can put their nose up to the wind and they can easily smell from 10, 15 kilometers away. Sometimes a human can smell uh, communities or perhaps there's a hunting camp up, up the coast. Of course, when you get hungry, well, you're attracted to that smell of organic material and that tends to be where people are. So that's when you get the combination of, of bears that are in ever declining condition coming uh, more often and ever closer and sometimes you know, physically uh, chasing people and, and plundering uh, food stores and certainly looking for human uh, refuse garbage dumps. And that's mm -hmm. the kind of conflict uh, situation that uh, WWF and, and the communities and the government are trying to help address. It's really a climate adaptation reality. That's right. And, and WWF did support a project to address this. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, just north of Churchill, the Inuit community of Arviat uh, had increasing number of such incidents. And what we were able to do for the last three years uh, is um, install some solar-powered electric fences around the dog teams there. And the dog meat and the dogs themselves were an organic smell affecting the bears. And generally the community was a smelly place and the bears <laughs> were curious and hungry. And actually, uh, what used to be, I think, uh, five or six uh, bears per year had to be killed by uh, the local police and, and uh, conservation officers. Now, with, with that and a nighttime patrol that we were able to add through WWF's uh, funding donation from Coca-Cola, in this case, I think, um, we actually reduced for the last two years the number of defense kills the community had to make of polar bears to zero. So... That's a really good uh, practical example of what, how we're able to help. And not that we've solved the climate change problem and the hungry bears being ashore, but we've reduced uh, to zero the number of bears killed and there have been no people killed. Okay, great. Now, Stefan, um, with the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Manitoba, maybe you can talk a little bit about how uh, Manitoba, I guess, addresses this conflict. And um, at the zoo, you have, uh, I think, three polar bears that um, came in as a result of um, conflicts between humans and polar bears. And, um, and you're able to conduct studies and learn more about the species. Yeah, Churchill's been interacting with uh, polar bears for many, many years, and they've got a, a really great system of a polar bear alert to try and mitigate problem bear and problem in people's people bears as much as possible. Um, but there still are kind of unfortunate events that occur. Um, this year was a particularly bad year in that we ended up with two orphans and then one bear that attacked a person. Um, and the province of Manitoba has decided that they feel that these bears are, are really important um, for communicating to people in the south the importance of climate change, for um, allowing more research so we can learn more about polar bears and more about ways to prevent uh, human polar bear interactions or negative interactions. And so the decision by Manitoba has been to um, allow orphan cubs and under certain circumstances bears that would normally um, have to be euthanized to come down into the International Polar Bear Conservation Center mm -hmm. um, and then with proper permitting to a zoological facility from there. So we're, we're trying to look at really unfortunate events and say how can we maximize the benefit to polar bears by really getting people in the south to connect and then hopefully make 
changes in their life that'll lower uh, climate change emissions um, and, and thus feed back to a better Arctic climate and more habitat for polar bears. Yeah, okay. Um, and I mean, we're speaking sort of uh, about, I guess, food and, and you know ways that polar bears are trying to feed themselves. And um, this relates to a question we, we're, we got from uh, Kyler in Guelph who wants to know where are polar bears in the food chain? Are they sort of at the top or who, what's who's above them? Well, yeah. they're, they're, they're right at the top. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're right up there with probably humans and I think we trade back and forth on who the real top is. Okay, all right. Um, well, uh, we've been getting a lot of great questions, so thank you. Keep sending them to us through the Q&A box or email us at live at wwfcanada.org. Well, Pete and Stefan, you have been amazing um, sharing all of this great polar bear knowledge and uh, stories with us. Um, and I want to thank you for your work on this. It's, it's, um, it's really important and it's um, fantastic that you're doing this. Um, and I'm sure our, our audience is eager to ask you more questions. Um, before I get to those, though, I would like to mention that our Arctic conservation work is made possible by generous contributions from our donors and Coca-Cola through the Arctic Home Campaign. From now until March 15th, um, Coca-Cola will match dollar for dollar any donation to the Arctic Home Campaign to a maximum of one million. So any gift made in Canada during this time will be doubled. Um, Pete, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why it is so critical that this work in the Arctic continues to be funded and supported. Yeah, really there's, there's, there's three main things that people can do. I mean, the first one is that <laughs> We don't actually know enough about polar bears. I think the map that was shown earlier about the denning areas, as Stefan uh, emphasized, it didn't exist before we were able to take some money and uh, do the analysis and produce such a map. And that's critical for a land use and a decision maker people to you know, make the right areas protected and other areas for economic development as the ice melts, as more and more resources people want to dig up from the Arctic and send elsewhere. So information is critical. Communication is critical too. And it's not just money or, or research. And everybody who's listening to this today, if they went back and uh, talked to 50 people about what they've heard and the issues, then that would just spread the word. And it would become a different priority to look after the Arctic, both for what's in the Arctic and what it does for regulating our Earth's climate pattern. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, of course, we, we, we need uh, funds to actually enable this kind of project to occur, but also the, the kind of project that uh, we talked about with the Inuit community in Arviat and other communities that are experiencing the impacts of rapid climate change because humanity is just uh, as yet not really tackling greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions. So those are all crucial things if you're interested in leaving the Arctic and the planet in decent shape for our grandchildren. Okay, thank you, Pete. Um, so we've just put up the link, and or we will do so shortly in the chat box to the donation page um, for Arctic Home Campaign, or you can click on the Donate Now button on the right side of the page if you're watching on wwf.ca slash live. So if you love polar bears as much as we do and want to help secure a healthy future for the Arctic and for the species, please make a gift to WWF's Arctic work. Um, do it today so that your donation can be doubled. That's a, it's this amazing opportunity from Coca-Cola. Um, visit wwf.ca slash arctic home and you can learn more about the campaign and what the funds go to support. So thank you so much in advance and um, we do really appreciate that. So um, let's take some more questions from the audience. Um, Stefan, I've got a question from uh, for you from Jordan in grade four. We've got some great questions from students today. If polar bears can swim, why do they die when they don't have icebergs anymore? That's a great question. Yeah, so the sea ice really provides a a couple of things. One, it's a platform so they can get out to where the seals are without having to swim all the time. Um, but also, it's a it's more efficient for a polar bear to move across ice than it is water. You're not losing as much energy um, through heat loss, but you're just 
you're still polar bears walk great, and so they walk a lot better than they swim. They can swim for amazing distances. I think the record is like 800 kilometers, 600 kilometers, wow. amazing distance. Um, but really, they're using a lot more energy than if they they're walking. So. Um, yeah, that platform, being able to get to those seals, that's really the the important um, aspect that they need to get to have. Uh, it's their habitat. Okay, great. And Pete, um, this one's for you. Jen wants to know, why are polar bears known to be aggressive? Why can't we create a truce with polar bears? And <laughs> can you talk a little bit more about your conflict mitigation work? Did you, did you have to go in and stop a fight or, you know? <laughs> Well, you know, appealing as they are, cute and cuddly when they're tiny as they are, they are a top huge carnivore and they eat things. And carnivores, when they are uh, fighting for mates, the males tend to be aggressive. That's just the way they are because it's a fierce competition. The winner takes all. Similarly, uh, female polar bears are incredibly good mothers, but they are highly aggressive. I've seen them... Uh, chasing off and fighting back big males who are coming in to try and eat their cubs. So, <laughs> you know, just the way they are. And, of course, they're so powerful that you would never want to be uh, right up with a polar bear. So, so okay. be it. Okay, okay, great. Um, Steph, in your turn, I have a question from McGowan in grade 5 who um, asks, why do, pol uh, why do human eyes see polar bear fur as white if it's actually clear? Is that, is that true? Is their fur clear? Yeah, when you look at it under a microscope, it actually looks like a thread of glass, and it is really clear. What's happening is it's reflecting back a lot of that visible spectrum, so that's what you're seeing. That's why it looks white. It's just reflecting so much of that back. And we see a lot of Arctic species um, actually do have white fur, and we think that that's... Uh, related to the best camouflage for, for being in snow all the time. Okay, amazing. And uh, Stefan, another, or maybe I'll, Pete, I'll give this question to you. Um, Asha in grade four wants to know, how fast is the polar bear population growing? Because there are parts um, of the world that where the population is increasing. Is that right? Yeah, that's a bit of a loaded question in a way because okay. until, about, until about 40, 50 years ago polar bears had been severely hunted in many parts of the world and they may still be actually over hunted in some parts of Russia but the few areas uh, that are increasing are all areas where the polar bear population used to be like this and it was taken right down low almost till they were wiped out so obviously they've now you take off the hunting pressure and it's been regulated by the polar bear convention. Uh, the numbers are increasing, but they uh, generally aren't yet back to the level they were at before hunting was really too intense. So mm -hmm. in the rest of the polar bears range, unfortunately, Canada's a good example. About one third of Canada's 13 polar bear subpopulations uh, are either in decline or showing signs of uh, being unhealthy, and that relates uh, largely to habitat these days, not to overhunting. Okay. And, and Stefan, do you know how many polar bears are left in the world? Do we have an exact uh, count on that? We, we never have an exact count. <laughs> the okay. estimate is between 20 and 25,000 polar bears. Yeah. Um, and this is another area where you think, you know, how hard is it to count a bunch of white, you know, huge mammals? And it actually turns out to be quite challenging and quite expensive. So there's many areas where we need more surveys, more more work to really nail down what those trends are. Are they declining, increasing? Are they stable? And, yeah, how many are there? Yeah. A okay. good question for budding scientists to. Uh, I know this is great, and mm -hmm. we're just getting more. So we'll we'll keep going um, get, and take a, a few more questions. Um, Pete, back to you. Asha wants to know how many babies do polar bears have per year? Well, usually uh, they, they don't breed every year. The female in many regions um, looks after the young for a couple of years, um, but. 
quite often two is the average, although in populations like southern Hudson Bay it's been well studied, um, females are not in quite as good condition when they go into their maternity den, so they're actually um, having slightly fewer young now, down to one, one and a half on average. Mm. Uh, occasionally, I have seen triplets once, but the majority of them, the families I've seen in the denning areas as they come out at this time of year are either ones or twos. So that, it does relate to the amount of energy that the female can put on in the previous spring. And in fact, I think it's one of the longest um, natural um, fasting stories in the animal kingdom because that female will have her last meal in June She'll go into the maternity den in October, November, and she'll have give birth at Christmas, New Year. She won't eat again, as Stefan was describing, until the following uh, March, April. So not only does she have to put on enough fat to survive that herself, but she has to give birth, and then she has to suckle those young until they can get out to finally catch a seal sometime in March, uh, 50 kilometers out on Hudson Bay. That's quite remarkable. Yeah, well, if if I haven't eaten for that long, I would probably be really grumpy when I, <laughs> when I wake up finally. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stefan, back to you. Um, Jennifer and uh, her kindergarten class wants to know, how do you get close enough to check the health of a polar bear? Now, you have to do this when you collar them or when you try to track them on satellite, right? So how do you get close enough to, to do anything with the polar bear? Yeah, so... Usually, uh, or the standard way is actually to dart them with a sedative, um, and then once once they fall asleep, they uh, they're easier to handle. Um, there's been a lot of research recently in looking at how do we do this without having to handle the animal at all. So, can we take uh, photographs? Can we measure body condition based on? the size of the bear. Can we count bears by using aerial surveys instead of captures or other different ways to do it? Um, here in at Assiniboine Park Zoo, we do a lot of training so that the bears present their open mouth so we can look at mm -hmm. dental problems. Or in some zoos, they've got them so you can get a voluntary blood draw. So the bear puts its foot out, the vets take uh, a blood sample and they do their diagnostics that way. So I think it's kind of an exciting time where we've got some kind of standard ways of doing things, but we're also exploring a lot of less invasive ways to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And Pete, and, and I think this will be the last question. Pete, um, Ty wants to know, is there any forensic evidence that gives us an idea of what large predators uh, did during the last warming in the Arctic? There probably is. I, I have to say, I mean, there were saber-toothed tigers, uh, which as far as I know didn't rush out onto sea ice, but I am not really uh, up on that. It's a great question because, as we said earlier, that longer time scale is so important to tell us something about uh, likely uh, how animals are going to respond in different situations. But Stefan, maybe you know. I, I don't yeah, know we, know, we know a little bit in some places. There's a, a group of bears on the ABC Islands, and it looks like what happened based on the genetics is that uh, grizzly bears came in and mated with polar bears, and now we have grizzly bears that have some of the genetic components of polar bears. So in that case, we know that polar bears, the way we think of them, have just gone extinct on that island, but they didn't go extinct completely dead. They were slowly diluted by male grizzly bears mating with females right. that were on the island. So. so is this what you call the growlers or the prizzlies? I imagine if humans were around, they would probably call them growlers or pizzlies at yeah. the beginning. Now they're just this really strange group of grizzly bears that have been puzzling geneticists hmm. for a long time until it was finally the puzzle was pieced together. We know in some places we do get those hybrids now, yeah. uh, which is quite fascinating. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to squeeze in one last question because we've been getting a lot of questions from our audience members about food and what polar bears eat. Um, so can, can Pete, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what do they eat and why do they love seals? What's so tasty about seals? Oh, finally. I, I have a skull here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a skull of a this ringed seal. Yeah. This is an adult ringed seal. It's actually quite a small seal a bit like the size of seal you'd see in the harbor down in uh, our parts of the world in the south. But this is the staple diet of the polar bear, the preferred diet. This species and then the much bigger one, the bearded seal, which is more like a walrus in, in its size. And basically, the polar bear is really good as a, as a stealth hunter waiting at the hole until the ring seal comes up and then catching it. So. They are laden with fat in the spring, and fat is really the key to the polar bear putting on enough energy to survive these cold conditions and this fasting period. So it's seals. Occasionally they, they catch um, the odd beluga whale or perhaps scavenge a, a bowhead whale carcass on the beach. They'll take what they can. They eat a few things in the summer like goose eggs, but those are nowhere close to the amount of energy that they need to survive the annual cycle. So seals, they're good at catching and that provides the energy they need. That's really why they evolved that way. And, and do they use their nose as sort of their, their hunting tool? Because I, I saw a, um, an interesting prop that you have in your office where um, you can tell <laughs> the, the nose is quite... All dry. right, you're giving me... All right, I'm... <laughs> I'll hold it and Stefan, you can talk about the nose. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I can talk a little bit in that they have this great nose and it's really got a lot of kind of um, turbinoid bones, but just basically big, big surface area inside that, that nose. It's really great in kind of catching every single molecule of scent from a prey and uh, letting the bear know which way to go and where mm. tasty food is. All right. Okay. Well, you see, thank you. You see, you see what would happen if you're in your tent and one of these guys comes along. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, this Thanks. is actually what you do all day in your office, right? You play with <laughs> yeah, we have fun. Well. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, guys, we, we really are running out of time. Um, but uh, thank you so much for sharing all of this great information. I, I've certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure our, our viewers are, have learned a lot as well. Um, so thank you to our audience for joining us um, today uh, on this uh, polar bear sort of uh, conversation. And, um, and I'm sure you now have enough polar bear factoids that's probably coming out of your ears. So did I or didn't I keep my promise to you, right? I, I said I would uh, get you ready um, for International Polar Bear tomorrow, uh, International Polar Bear Day tomorrow, and uh, and I think we have succeeded in that. So, a big thanks um, to everyone who's watching. A big thanks if you made a contribution today to our Arctic uh, Home campaign. Don't forget again, your gift to um, Arctic Home will be matched from now until March 15th. Um, Pete and Stefan, thanks thanks again, and thanks for all your work on on this. It's very important. So for all of you watching, please stay in touch um, with WWF. You can check out our website. It's WWF.ca for more polar bear stories and ways to get involved. And from all of us at WWF, thank you for hanging out with us today. I hope you'll join us again for our next Google Hangout in April. And details for that uh, will be coming soon, so stay tuned. And uh, goodbye from us here at WWF. Thank you all. Thanks.